more than before. More than before. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 says this. Philippians 3 verse 12 says this, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, though that's not what my wife says. But I press on that I may lay hold of that which in Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, I forget those things that are behind, I reach forward to those things that are ahead, and I press toward to the goal of the prize of the upward call in God, in Christ Jesus. And verse 15 really sums it up. It says, therefore, let as many as us are mature, those that are thinking smart and straight, have this mind. And if anything you think otherwise, that God reveal this even unto you. The great thing about our Christian journey, it's not how we start, it's how we finish. And one of the things I love about God is the very grace orientation He has towards me and all of humanity. If you look back through the Bible, the great leaders, the great people we recognize, Paul, for example, who wrote most of the New Testament, started as the original Antichrist. It wasn't his start, it was his finish. And it doesn't matter who you go back to, Moses, Abraham, Joseph, Peter, James, all of them had lousy starts, but end up with great finishes. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel a whole lot better. And it gives me credibility, the possibility that I can be all that God wants me to be. See, we are designed to move forward, to improve, to increase, to be more than we were before. If you, if you see the terminology in that scripture, it's all about, I press on, I reach forward, I don't look back, I, I go towards the upward call. Even God's first commandment to mankind in Genesis 1 verse 28 says, go forth and decrease. No, sorry, it says go forth and stay the same. No, no, it says go forth and multiply. It says go forth and be more, be fruitful. There's nothing about decrease or retreat or even stay the same in the Bible. Any, for example, anybody want to be poorer this year? Stupider. I usually get one or two hands there. And don't, I always say, don't worry, you're on your way. Anybody like losing? I, I mean, there's nothing. The only people that like losing are people that are playing golf with their boss. And I tell my staff that regularly. We don't like it. We're not built for that. Our challenge is to be all that God wants us to be. For Australia, this great nation, the church needs to be all that God wants it to be. For our generations that lay ahead, we need to be all that God wants us to be. And it's not just our challenge, but it's also our design. There's a, there's a plan of God that we move into our future better, stronger, bigger than we were before, doing more for the things of heaven than we've seen in the past, whatever years. There's a, there's a sense of God saying, keep going, church. Keep going, Christian. Keep going, believer. Ephesians 3.19 says this, to know the, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God, all, all the things that He has for you, all the great things that He wants in you and through you, that, that we go all the way. So today I'm looking at some great kingdom principles of increase and breakthrough. So you can start 2014 with where you are, with a picture of where you want to be, whether it be in family, whether it be in business or ministry or whatever you're doing, some principles of heaven. It's all out of 2 Kings today, chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 14, we're going to look at. But there are some principles that I've found that will help move you into your future. And, and, and that's the plan that God has for us. He wants to build His church that is so strong that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the church is not a building, it's you and I. He's trying to build a people that will go into the future and take this great nation into the great Southland of the Holy Spirit. I don't just want to sing about it, I want to see the plan of God activated over our generation, that we become the great Southland of the Holy Spirit. The first thing that I believe you need to understand about moving into your future is the principle of attachment. Principle of attachment. 2 Kings chapter 2 and 3. This is the story of Elijah and Elisha. Elisha is the uh, prophet. Elijah is the younger prophet. And this is, he's joined with Elijah. And in verse 2, we, we see the principle of attachment. Then Elijah says to the young man, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. 
And Elijah said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Three other times in the scripture, uh, the prophet leans over to the young prophet and says, you know what? You had a busy day. It's been a big weekend. Take the week off. God's called me to go down there. Uh, you just stay here and rest. And every time he puts this pressure on the young prophet, the young prophet responds by, by the hair of your chinny chin chin. You can call me shadow if you want, but we're stuck together in this. And the reason this is important, because Elisha, the young prophet, Elisha, the young prophet, understood the power of a Attachment. Elijah wasn't trying to get rid of him. He was putting pressure on the young man's dreams to see if he's prepared to pay the price to go to the next place. And Elisha stuck to Elijah. He stuck his, to his way forward. The question I ask myself and I'm going to ask you this morning is this, who or what are you attaching yourself to to take you into your future? What information, what biblical concepts, what people around you are you attaching yourself like Elisha did to Elijah that will be a part of your answer in the future? Well, what sort of person and knowledge do you need to take you into the dream that God has for you? You see, our dilemma as Australians, and if there there are some weaknesses in in Australian culture and attitude, it's certainly the uh, tall poppy syndrome. So I think it's changing in the church. I think we're breaking that one through, but people get intimidated by successful people. In other words, instead of being motivated by success, they're intimidated by success. And that's a really sad thing because that, that, that disempowers you from learning what, to, what you need to go into your future. Somebody drives in in a brand new Mercedes Benz outside on a Sunday morning. It's the latest model. And, and you're looking at the car and, and you're thinking, your, your response often is not, wow, that's awesome. It's, how did they get that? I know them. They can't. How do they get? What? What the? You know, you, 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 instead of rejoicing, you feel like getting a 20 cent coin and slipping it down the side. I mean, so you either, people are either intimidated by success or they're motivated by success. And if you're intimidated by people that are doing well at anything at any level, it buries you or, 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 or obstructs you from learning and finding out what you need to learn to take you in the future. It's like getting onto a plane and watching people get under business class. Big shots. And you look at your stub and it says 100 Z. It's the last chair on the plane. That was your trip back. Oh, I was in the Dean's trip, yes, sir. That's right, on the Dean's trip back, they ran out of food. And they made, they got a couple of olives and a bit of lettuce and said, that's a salad for the, thing. that's right, I remember that. And hers was 100 Z. It was the last chair, doesn't go back more than, a, you know, doesn't, the air hostess puts a bag behind it, just to make sure we don't get any, any. Isn't it funny how, how planes, they, 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 there's the upright, you know, we're landing, please go to upright. And then there's the comfort zone. And who knows the upright is like this, and the comfort is like. <laughs> and you know what amuses me? Because if you land like this, you'll die. But if you're like this, you're fine. That's dangerous. That's good. Yeah, that's safety. It's like, what, do, you know, anyway. You're watching them and you're thinking, hope the plane crashes, you'll all die first. You know, there's that sense of intimidation rather than motivated. You know, there's plenty of room up there. And if you start to break through on that, that probably a negative Australian attitude, you start to embrace people that do well. You start to get around them. You start to not be, man, you start to be motivated by people's success and you start to attach yourself to take you into your future. If you want to move into the things that God has for you, make sure you're not intimidated, but you're motivated by people that are doing well in whatever field and start to get stuck to information and those people that can take you into your future. This is the reason. If you don't know the end of the story, I'm gonna tell you right now. Elisha, the young prophet, ends up with a double portion, all right, of the the mantle, the anointing of Elijah. And one of the reasons he gets to have more than before is because he understood the principle of attachment. Who and what? Are you attaching yourself to take you in the future? Second thing is this. Elisha had an awakening. An awakening is, it's, it's, when, it's like when God opens up your head. Drops in a live grenade. Boom. 
and it explodes. And all of a sudden, you're seeing things a little bit differently. It's an awakening. It's not just when your thinking changes, it's when your believing starts to change. You have a revelation of possibility. Uh, You have a revelation that alters everything. And Elisha has this wake awakening. He has this revelation that, man, here's a picture that anything is possible. Look at verse nine. And so it was when they crossed over that Elijah, the older prophet, says to the young man, Elisha, ask what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you. Listen to the response of the young prophet. Elijah's response, you're you're asking me what I want? This is what I want. Please let me have a double portion of your spirit upon me. Which sounds really nice and prophetic, but what the young man's really saying to the old guy is this. I like your work, but I want to be twice as good as you. That's what he's saying. He says, I don't, I don't want to be as good as you. I want to be twice as good as you. And that's an incredible awakening that, number one, it's possible to be more than you are right now. And number two, it's okay with God that, that you have more money, be smarter be better married, have a better family, be stronger in your sins. It's okay with God. All those things are possible and okay. And what Elijah, Elisha had was a revelation that it could be more, that with God all things are possible, and I want to be not just as good as you. you know, as, a, as, a, as a senior pastor, I've always hated the word senior pastor. You know, And all, for, for 20 years I've been trying to think of a new word, and I finally the new words come in. It's called lead pastor. But I'm so old now, senior's fine. <laughs> I don't care anymore. You know, but they're, 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 I don't want the next generation to be as good as me. I don't want to be twice as good as me. I, I, don't, I don't build a group, a church that's done the same as we did before. We need a church to rise up and do twice as much as it's done before. You and I are not called to do the same. We're called to do twice as much. There is a double portion ready. And it's possible. I, you know why I know it's possible? Because even in the natural thing, have you considered sporting records? The Olympics. I, you know what I love about the Olympics most? I mean, not, well, firstly, I watch sports I never watch any other time. Like badminton. And anyway, the point is, there's always records getting broken. I mean, 100-meter sprint. I mean, what's it going to be in the, in the year 2048? What is going to be the world record for a 100-meter sprint? Well, the world record is 7.1 seconds or 5.2 seconds. Or what's the high jump record going to be in 2048? And they just cleared seven meters. And yet we laugh at that. So much. But you know what? The results today could never be imagined 25 years ago. They would have laughed at them. It's impossible. So what, what, what is it? How come records keep getting broken? How come people can jump higher, run? Is it, is it global warming? <laughs> is it gravity's getting less dense? How come people keep breaking records? Do you know what it is? These people, these top athletes, they're so stupid to think that anything's possible. They never go out there to equal a record. They go out there to break a record. And because they believe that they can, you know what? Often they just go and do it. And it's the same in the spiritual realm. It's if we can believe that we can, we can go to new places we've never dreamed of. In your family, in your marriage, your business, your spiritual side, your ministry, it's all there. It's just a revelation and it's good with God. It's okay. Faith is not what you think that you believe. Faith is what you believe when you don't think. Faith is not a head substance. Faith is a heart substance. You know when you have faith because you don't have to think about it. Faith, the whole Christian journey is to get information into revelation. Information lives here, revelation lives here. What we know lives here, what we believe lives here. What we think about there, but what we do comes out of here. And once we get a revelation of that it's possible with God, all things, then we start to move into a new place, a new level, a new place of God. So let's make sure to have more, we need to have an awakening today, this moment, that God can do all things 
Doesn't matter what it looks like. God can do all things and he's okay. People say, oh, we don't want to be gee, worried about, you know, like, don't want to be stealing God's glory. Good luck with that. I think God's glory is pretty safe. I think it's okay. I think we've got a little way to go to worry about God. Oh my gosh, look at Mark. He's getting almost godlike. I don't think so. <laughs> Stop laughing so hardly. <laughs> Laugh a little bit, but not that hard. Enjoy yourself, but not that much. Uh. So let's make sure we get our place a place in God that we find a revelation with God, all things are possible for this year. And that he's okay with it. He's good with it. And that is the reason that Elisha ends up with a double portion because he believed. He asked, I can have that. I want that. The third thing, you need to keep hungry for your dream. You need to keep hungry for whatever God's put in front of your eyes. Don't give up on it too early, too soon. The greatest threat to any visionary is reality. Visionary is looking what could be, what the possibility, where are we going to go, what's going to go on? And then they look around. You go, what the heck? How am I going to get from here to here? And nothing steals hunger like a sense of it's not possible. We need to make sure we keep hungry for the dream that God has for you. In 2040, if it didn't come to pass in 2011, if it didn't come to pass in 2012, if it didn't come to pass in 2030, well, this year is going to be the year that we're going to go to a new level in this whole thing. Can't give up. You've got to keep hungry for the dream that God has for you. People without dream. Listen, the greatest tragedy in life is not that we die. It's that we die while we're still alive. We lose our dream. We lose our mission, our vision, our reason, and we've got to keep hungry for it. To be more, to do more, you've got to keep hungry for it. Don't lose your hunger. You can create and keep hunger. This is the good news. You can create and keep hunger. And if you've lost hunger for your, your family, your marriage, your business, the spiritual things of God, well, listen to this, because right now I'm going to tell you how to get that hunger back. It's not mystical. It doesn't drop out of, uh, of, of some elusive spiritual concept. It's something that we can bring back to life. It's a power that we can do it. And I use the word that it's the power of lust. And the only reason I use that word is because Christians don't like it. Because lust has a very negative context. Lust. And we understand lust. It's a bad thing. But lust is neither, neither good nor bad. It just depends how you use it. Lust is an extreme emotion. So you can lust after the wrong things or you can lust after the right things. You can lust after the things of God. That's not a bad thing. Oh, how did he say that? You can do that. Wives should lust after their husbands. And all the men had a really good chance to say amen then, <laughs> but you're all too scared. <laughs> Pathetic. And lust is a very powerful thing. Like Jesus even uses the word in context to give you even a greater picture of it. He says this, he says, if you lust after a woman, it's just as bad as committing adultery. I want you to think about that. Well, that's right. No, it's not. It's not as bad. To lust after a woman is nowhere near as bad as committing adultery. That makes sense to me. I mean, but the Bible, yeah, I know that. So what is Jesus saying? He did not say that if you look at another woman. He did not say if you think about other women. He says once you got to the point of lust, you're now out of control. See, once you get to the point of lust, you're in. So when he says it's just as bad to lust after a woman that is committed adultery, what he's saying is you're, down, you're in. You haven't done it, but you're in. That's what lust is. Lust is such a powerful emotion that once you got to that place, people don't go and just rob banks the first time they think about it. They don't, oh, it's a bank, let's rob it. They think about it. They dwell on it. They go over it and then eventually it catches their soul. Now they're in lust and just as bad as doing it is when you're in that place. That's how powerful lust is. So lust after good things is okay with God because that means you're in. It's a, it's a very powerful thing, and you can create lust. That's what I'm trying to say here. You can create that love, that hunger back inside of you, and uh, don't get caught up on the word lust. Get caught up on the word or the context of which it comes in, in the sense that it's something once we can build inside of us, we can get back to love our husband like we used to, to love the family, to love that. Whatever it is you've lost it for can be brought back today. Let me explain how this works. How you build this. There's a restaurant in America called Claim Jumpers. And uh, as far as, and I've been to lots of restaurants in America, but the, the restaurant with the biggest servings of food 
is claim jumpers. You order a rack of ribs, and no, no doubt, it's as big as this pulpit. There's a tail and a head still on it. It's a cow. And the apple pie, listen, the apple pies, they're, they're, this is just, they're $6.95. There is, they're about 12, no, 10 inches, 10 inches across, maybe that high. Then it's surrounded by cream and whipped cream. It could feed all of New South Wales. <laughs> and so what happens is you're eating all this food and you're trying to get through the main meal. And, oh, so full, your belt buckle's pointing south. <laughs> you can't breathe. And you're going, this is ridiculous. I'm never going to eat again. That's it. I'm done with food for the rest of my life. I'm never going to. That's the whole thing of it. And then this little waitress walks up the table and she smiles at you and says, you're like that? And we say, oh, that was great. We just so can't believe it. I can't believe it. And she looks out and says, anybody would like some dessert? And now you don't say it, but in your head you're going, you're an idiot. How could anybody eat dessert after a meal like that? That's not possible to eat dessert. And we all say, no, no, we're not eating for, no, no, we're not eating for the rest of the year. This is it, our last meal. And she says, okay then. And what she does, she goes away and she gets a trolley with this apple pie dessert and a chocolate cake and just brings it back and puts it right next to the table and walks away. Just leaves it there. And so we're going through a whole routine. I'm never going to eat again. Oh, I'm so full. Oh, for the best, biggest. And in, a, in not, not a long time, maybe five to seven minutes, a miracle of God takes place. Something comes, and all of a sudden you can feel room. <laughs> and it's so hilarious because, you know, once one person, you know what, I'm going to have dessert, and then the whole table, yeah, me too, you know, me too. <laughs> you have to put the doggy bags in the back of utility to get home. <laughs> what I'm saying is that you create lust, listen to this, and Jesus is what Jesus was saying, you create lust, either form bad or good, by what you continually put in front of your eyes. And what you put in front of your eyes will determine down the track how much in love with that thing is, right or wrong, doesn't matter. And that's why Jesus said, when you lust, when you get to that point in the chain of not think, not look, not, when you lust, it's just as bad because you're in. But the other side of it is this. If it's your family, you need to build your vision back for, put them in front of you. What's your, what's your business plan? What's your ministry context? What, what is it? Put it in front of your eyes. And continually look at, because what you continually look at, eventually you start to want and desire and lust after. To keep hungry, keep looking. Verse 10. Says this. So Elijah, he said, what do you want, double portion? Yeah, yeah. He said, you've asked a hard thing. Not hard for me to give, but a hard thing for you to receive. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you're not there at the end, if you don't keep your hunger in place, if you don't make it all the way, if you don't give up, if you see me at the end, it says, then you will have what your hearts desire. What you continually look at, what you keep in front of me, in front of you is where you end up. Elisha kept hungry for the double portion and kept his eyes on the man of God that would take him there. Today, keep focused on your dream. Keep focused on the, the thing that God's put in your heart. Keep focused. Don't give up on it. Yeah. And we start to see this young man turning not just to a prophet, but a prophet that has a double portion anointing. Yeah. Today, God wants you at the end of 2014 to be more than you are right now. Amen. He wants more for you than before. Today, we've got to inherit or accept or, or gather in the principles that God has given us. So all things become possible. And the greater that is in us, the greater we can do through the world around us. And Australia, our generation needs Jesus. It needs the, the power and the love of God. I, I want to make sure that in history, in history, that we as a generation will be seen to bring the Holy Spirit to the great Southland. The ones that, 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 that somehow bucked the system, went beyond what was happening and saw God move in their nation and their cities at a great level today. Today, let's be like Winston Churchill who said this, history will be kind to me for I intend to write it. 
Let's be a church that writes the history of our generation. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes today?